Sunday of Lent. Um, Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, and that begins the 40 days of Lent, not counting Sundays. And so next Sunday, uh, we will begin a uh, five-week sermon, well, we'll begin a five-week study on the book, The God We Can Know, which is the I Am Statements of Jesus. So if you would like to be involved with that, that'll be at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings, starting next week for just five weeks, and we'll meet in the parlor. Um, if you want, there's a there's still a couple of books up here that are available for first come first serve, um, but you don't have to read the book in order to participate in the study. It's just a, a benefit to have read the chapters ahead of time. Also on Wednesdays at the Christian Church on Wednesday evenings, there's a dinner at six o'clock, and then at six forty five, we're also doing a small group study on the same book, The God We Can Know. So you can do Wednesday or Sunday mornings if you'd like to be involved with that. We will be having youth tonight, and it is going to be a taco bar and movie night. So it'll start at 5.30 still, but it'll run longer than 7 o'clock. I think it's until 8. Yeah, yeah. so 5.30 to 8 for the youth tonight. Hopefully they'll be able to, to be there. Also, youth and children are invited on Wednesday evenings to come to the First Christian Church because Marlene is working with them to do a Monday, Thursday Easter drama. So we need all the youth and children we possibly can have so that they can practice the songs and they can practice the, um, the actions and the things that go along with the script for that. So hopefully we'll see a lot of participation there. We sing God of the Ages. <laughs>
How's everybody doing this morning? I didn't hear you. Good. Thank you. How are you this morning? Good. Have you guys ever traveled anywhere? Yes. Where'd you travel to? Georgia. Georgia, okay. Where'd you travel to? Florida. Florida. Myrtle Beach. Have you ever traveled anywhere? I'm Didn't travel everywhere before? No. Well, that's okay. I bet you will someday. Okay. What do you take when you travel? Clothes. Clothes? What, what do you put it in? A Stow the bag? Carry your bag? A suitcase. A suitcase, okay. Um, a duffel bag. A duffel bag, okay. What else do you take besides clothes? Stuff you need. Stuff you My need. Toothbrushes. Toothbrushes, that's a good idea. We always need our toothbrushes, don't we? And a wean. What else would you take? What if you're going to spend the night somewhere? Pajamas. You might have our pajamas. How about our favorite teddy bear? And stuffed animal blanket. Stuffed animal blanket. I mean, that makes the trip a little better in the car, don't it? Yeah, and a pillow. And a pillow. Oh, we can't forget the pillow. What about if we traveled to Illinois? Do we need anything special to go there? Clothes? Your clothes? Well, I traveled to Illinois twice last week. I just took the clothes I had on. Your car. My car, yeah. Your credit what? card. <laughs> My credit card, yeah. Gas. Gas. I don't buy gas over there. I come back to Missouri. But it was like 50 cents higher. And we need things to give everybody warm. Need things to keep everybody warm? Oh, that's a good thing, especially this time of the year. Because the temperature goes up and down and up and down, don't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get super cold and we don't have cover. You're right. You will get super cold. food and snacks? Food and snacks? Food something to drink? Yeah. Maybe your favorite toy? Yeah. Well, what if we traveled, say, outside of the United States? What do we need? Every day. A border pass. And I want to go a border pass? How about just a passport? Some days it might feel like a border pass. Just to try to get to Illinois. And I got to go work over there. <laughs> so a passport is what we have to travel with if we go outside of the United States, right? So we're going to learn something where Moses traveled today. We're going to find out what Moses did and where he traveled, and we're going to make our own passports today because we're going to travel to different places over the next few weeks. In your imagination. <laughs> Would that be fun? We need a passport so we can travel with our imagination. Passport? A passport. Yeah. We're going to make one today. What is that? Where those? Those are the cameras Joe's got up. Yeah. <laughs> did, you, did you know you're getting recorded? Uh-huh. Very good. And <laughs> was at my house and, yeah. and we did a pick, I did a pick up the ball. <gasps> yeah. And the leaves with it. And the leaves with it, okay. Well, can you guys join me in the Lord's Prayer and we'll go see what Moses did where he traveled to this week, okay? Let's bow our heads, please. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who are trespasses. great to have them learning the Lord's Prayer as they help lead you with the Lord's Prayer each week and uh, that's uh, important to keep, for them to keep writing all of those things on their hearts. Uh, and as we continue to remind ourselves of our faith and what we believe and, and the historical creeds of our faith, during Lent we're going to be reciting the Nicene Creed. So that's number 880 in your hymnal. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, uh, the words will also be up on the screen. So 
I just wanted to give you a warning if you started writing the Apostles' Creed that we're doing the, the Nicene Creed, which is another one of our Christian historical creeds. So I invite you to stand as you're able, and let's turn to number 880 in our hymnal or look at the screen and join together in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Mighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, the one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
verses 1 through 14. And this is about Moses at the burning bush. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Uh, that was the hardest part. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. Now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And he said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you, that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Thank you, Missy. Well, some of you might remember watching Popeye cartoons growing up, where one of his catchphrases was, I am what I am, followed by a yuck, 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 yuck. It was used as a way of explaining why he behaved the way that he behaved. Some psychologists have looked at Popeye as having a reasonably healthy response during a time of overwhelming uncertainty in the world. He became popular in the 1930s during the Depression and in between world wars. In the face of the bullying bludos of his life, he knew to focus on what gave him strength his spinach, and to be self-aware of his abilities and limitations. I am what I am. Now, evaluating Popeye's self-awareness and existential thinking sounds like a deeper interpretation of a cartoon personality than what I recall of this pipe-tooting, olive oil-rescuing character. But who knows? Maybe Popeye or his creator had wrestled with those key existential questions of life. Questions we all need to wrestle with. Who am I? Why am I here? And his answer was, I am what I am. Plus he added, I'm strong to the finish because I eat my spinach. <clears throat> I'm Popeye the sailor man. Popeye could give his answer to who am I? In today's text, we hear God responding to the question, who are you, with, I am who I am. Similar sounding to Popeye's declaration, and yet not the same at all. Over the next six weeks of Lent, we will be looking at how Jesus answered the question of who are you, 
and explore what his answers reveal to us about who God is and also who we are. We'll be looking at Jesus's I am statements in the Gospel of John. In chapter 8 of John's Gospel, Jesus finds himself debating with a group of religious folks who are bothered by what he is saying in his teachings. They accuse him of being a demon, and they call him a fake Jew by calling him a Samaritan. The Jews and the Samaritans did not get along, even though they both worshipped the same God and both traced their history back to Abraham. And in John 8, verse 53, the group finally asked Jesus, Who are you? Who do you claim to be? And Jesus answers by connecting himself with Abraham and finally says to them, Very truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. Now you might be hearing this and thinking that someone didn't translate the Greek verb tense correctly. Shouldn't Jesus have said before Abraham was, I was? But Jesus knew exactly what he was saying. He wasn't making any mistakes with grammar. He was choosing to reveal something about himself to the Jews. And the Jews would have had a thorough knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures, which we refer to as the Old Testament. And because of the knowledge that they had of the Hebrew scriptures, and because of what Jesus had said, they picked up stones to attack him. Now Jesus made his way out of the temple without being found, because Jesus could do that. But it seems like a pretty harsh punishment if we're just talking about a grammatical tense error here. But Jesus wasn't confused by his grammar. He was making a theological statement, one that those religious folks just could not accept. Jesus was claiming to be the Almighty God, or Yahweh. And to the Jewish leaders, this was blasphemy. And it was punishable by death, by stoning, according to the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament. Humans were not allowed to claim to be God. But then again, we have the benefit of knowing that Jesus was no ordinary human based on where we stand in time and history. Had we been highly religious people listening firsthand to the things that Jesus was claiming in the temple, we may have had stones in our hand too, based on how we had been taught growing up. In one of the earliest written versions of the Bible, the Greek word used for I am is ego ami. Ego, or ego as we say it, means I. You may be more familiar with that term from Dr. Sigmund Freud as he talks about the in, ego, and superego in psychological terms. And the Greek word ami means to be or to exist eternally or to have timeless being. Jesus was claiming to have eternal existence like God. Jesus proclaims to be God when he uses that verb for timeless being. I am ego ami. It's the same verb that's used in our story this morning in Exodus where God reveals God's self to Moses in that burning bush episode. In Exodus 3, God calls Moses to serve in a very special way, but Moses isn't so sure about this calling on his life. Uh, in fact, we didn't read the part, but he goes into all of these excuses of why he is not the right person to go and to rescue the Israelites from bondage in Egypt. And he wants to be sure that it's really God speaking to him out of the bush, that, that this voice that's telling him to go do this impossible sounding mission is really God. So he says, so what am I supposed to tell the Israelites when I go to free them? On whose authority am I acting? And God responds by saying, I am who I am. I am is the one sending you. Not I was or I will be, but I am always present. 
And God tells Moses that he will be with him every step of the way on this mission. Now the name of God was considered so sacred and holy by the Israelites, who later were referenced as Jews, that they would not permit anyone to say or write this God-revealed name. They created a special code based on the Hebrew verb to be using four letters called a tetragrammaton. No, I'm not making it up. The tetragrammaton consisted of four Hebrew letters that we translate today as Y-H-W-H. Y-H-W-H. Now, over time, translators eventually added vowels to the letters used to identify God, which is how we ended up with the word Yahweh. The Jews would not pronounce the name Yahweh, so they created other ways to talk about God without using that special revealed name that God gave to Moses. So they used things like Adonai, which means Lord, or Elohim, which means Holy God. The Tetragrammaton appears almost 7,000 times in the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, some of our English Bibles today translate that Hebrew Yahweh into Lord with all capital letters. So if, you, if in your Bible it says capital L-O-R-D, that's, that's a translation of the Tetragrammaton. Um, and if it spells Lord with a, just a capital L in lowercase O-R-D, then a lot of times that's a reference to Adonai um, as a translation. But in some Bibles lately, they just do Lord with a capital L at the beginning and not all the capitals. So it's hard to tell depending on which translation you have where it is depending on the version of the Bible. But it was, it was so holy that they could not say the name and they couldn't even write the name except for in this secret code. This high reverence for God and this understanding that God identified as I am to the Jewish people contributes to this negative reaction that Jesus receives from the crowd when he calls himself I am. And Jesus doesn't just do it once, but he does it multiple times in the Gospel of John. And we'll be exploring those I am statements during this Lenten season as we stay in the Gospel of John and see what Jesus is revealing to us about himself through those statements. And every time that Jesus used the phrase, I am, the religious leaders that were watching him got angrier and angrier to the point that they began to plot and plan how to destroy him. They want to arrest him for being blasphemous and for turning the hearts of some of the Jews away from the control of the religious leaders. They were losing power because people were following Jesus' teachings and not what they were teaching. And ultimately, they put their plan into action during what we call Holy Week, when we remember Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion. Now, if any of you have studied the Gospel of John before, you know that one of his overarching themes is that Jesus is God. He uses illustrations and examples from Jesus' life that demonstrate Christ's divinity, beginning with the opening verses of the Gospel, which parallel the opening verses of Genesis on purpose. John's Gospel states, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. <laughs> From those opening sentences, John emphasizes the pre-existence of Jesus as God from the very beginning of creation and that all things were created through him, the Logos, or Word, made flesh who dwelt among us. As we encounter Jesus in the Gospel of John, we discover not only that he claims to be one with God Almighty, but he also reveals some practical interpretations of what it means to be the eternal I am using ordinary images that people would understand. Through the eight primary I am statements, we learn that Jesus is the answer for our greatest needs, fears, and longings. Jesus is the bread of life who satisfies and sustains us. Jesus is the light of the world who provides God's guidance in darkness. Jesus is the gate to the kingdom of heaven. 
Jesus said, I am the good shepherd who cares for and protects others. Jesus is the true vine, connecting us with the power to live and be fruitful in this life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life who reveals the path for faithful living. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life who transforms death into life and offers God's endless possibilities to each and every one of us. And Jesus can be all of this because he has existed from before the time of Abraham as the great I am. The people surrounding Jesus from his disciples to the religious leaders had to decide how they were going to understand Jesus' identity. But they couldn't change Jesus' true identity as Lord and God, even with their anger or with their disbelief. They could reject him or accept him, but they could not change his eternal being. Jesus is God always has been, and always will be. In Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, Juliet asks, what's in a name? Where she claims that if you call a rose by any other word, it would still smell sweet. If you decide to call a rose by a different name, such as table, it wouldn't stop being a rose and doing the things that a rose does, such as release a sweet fragrance unless you're allergic and then maybe it's not so sweet to you. If you call a rose a table, it would be a flower with a very odd name, but its characteristics and its essence would still be that of a rose. Likewise, in 2002, when an American veteran of Vietnam decided to legally change his name to I am who I am, he was still a human being struggling to cope with the emotional pains of life. He did not become God by legally changing his name. In fact, he wanted to change his name to God, which the courts rejected. So he switched to I am who I am, which the courts allowed. He said he wanted to change his name in an effort to escape the horrible feelings and memories from the war so that he could begin a new life. He didn't understand that our new life comes from Jesus, our God. The God who entered into the human struggle to experience our pains, suffer for our sins, and save us. It's by accepting that Christ is God our Savior and allowing the Spirit to work in our life for transformation that we experience newness of life not just by calling ourselves something different. We're expected to mirror the life of Christ to others as we grow in faith, but we don't become God Almighty in the process. Human beings are created in the image of God, but God is the creator and we are the created. Changing our name does not make us God, but accepting Christ as Lord and Savior brings us to God for a holy makeover that in time we can look like Jesus to others. Jesus is not just some servant of God sent to do God's will. He's not just a great moral teacher for us to learn about. The Gospel of John reveals over and over again that Jesus is God in his very being. Jesus is the great I am, who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the apostles, and you and me. As we continue to explore the facets of the great I am over the next few weeks, I hope that you will develop a greater understanding of the God we can know and who wants to be known. I pray that we each will know God in a deeper way by the end of this Lenten season as we explore how Christ revealed himself to us through the I Am statements. And the more that we know the great I Am, the easier it will be to answer the question, Who am I? And hopefully we'll be able to declare scriptural truths in our lives instead of 
the stories that might run through our heads. Hopefully we'll be able to say things like, I am created by God. I am deeply loved. I am able to walk in a way that leads to life eternal because of Jesus. I am cared for in body, mind, and spirit by my Creator. I am connected to God and others in order to make a positive difference in the world. I am full of possibility because Christ lives in me. If you had to answer that question about yourself right now, though, I am blank, what are the first things that come to your mind to fill them in? And are they positive? And are they truthful about how God has created you and about what Christ has done for you? Author of books such as The Chronicles of Narnia and Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, once wrote this, quote, I am trying to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come away with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not let that open to us. He did not intend to, end quote. In Matthew 16, Jesus asks Peter, Who do you say that I am? And Peter replied, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus asks us today, Who do you say that I am? And what will be your reply? Amen. As we conclude our service today, I invite you to stand and sing our closing hymn, Blessed Be the Ties That Bind, number 557, as you continue to think about that connection that you have with Christ and that we have with each other because of Christ's great love for us. Number 557, five, Blessed Be the Ties That Bind. Let's just sing the first verse of that today. First verse. First verse. First verse. First verse. everyone that we do have coffee and donuts and a time of fellowship in the fellowship hall that everyone is invited to and I do hope that I will see some of you on Wednesday evening for the dinner at the Christian church at six o'clock but go now in the power of God's great love for you knowing that Jesus is the I am that Jesus is God and Jesus wants to be known by you so go forth knowing the love of God and filling yourself with that love so that you can love others in the same way. Go in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Oh, okay. Yeah.